Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me. This week, we come to the close of the book of Micah. It opens with a courtroom scene. Charges are brought by the Lord against his people. Charges of wickedness, the use of deceitful weights and measures, violence and lies. Witnesses are called. Mountains, hills, and foundations of the earth are called to hear the case. Good witnesses, as all of nature undoubtedly has felt the effects of sin in the land. Witnesses are called. Evidence is presented. Evidence of how the Lord redeemed them from the bondage of Egypt, brought them out, provided leadership through Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And then the Lord called his people to remember what he had done when Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse the children of Israel as they journeyed to the promised land. Remember that story? It's, in, it's recorded in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. And remember, it involved an angel that blocked the way of Balaam. It involved a donkey talking. Well, the Lord turned the curse into a blessing. And the Lord's blessing was with the children of Israel from the Acacia Grove to Gilgal. In other words, God's blessing covered them their entire journey. Evidence was presented, Micah 5 verse 5, that you may know the righteousness, the rightness of the Lord. Then the defense spoke up. They mentioned their offerings and their sacrifices, but their sins were so obvious that their argument was hollow. And then the closing statement was made, Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? In other words, do what is right, what is worthy. Love kindness and walk humbly with your God. The verdict, well, that's Micah chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. The Lord said, therefore, I will make you sick, weak, afflicted by striking you. I will make you desolate, stunned with the awareness of your sins. Your life shall be a life of emptiness. You will find no satisfaction. I will make your inhabitants a hissing. That's a scorn. They were to become the object of contempt and ridicule. And Micah knew the judgment was final. And then he poured out his heart. Micah 7 verses 1 and 2. First part of that second verse. Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth. Oh, what a conclusion. The faithful man, the good man, the kind man, the godly man has perished from the earth. Instead of being marked by good, Micah's day was marked by bribes and evil desires. Friends could not trust friends, and a man's enemies were the men of his own household. Husbands and wives could not trust each other, and parents could not even trust their own children. That's verses 3 through 6. Every person was living for themselves. Micah gave us quite a picture of his heart in that moment. Hear it again, 
Verse 1, I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit, which my soul desires. Now in West Texas, that's a picture of the fields after the cotton is harvested. Stubble, and only stubble as far as you can see. Micah's soul was longing for the first ripe fruit, but no cluster could be found. And he is talking spiritually, isn't he? As a kid, I grew up in a, in a city, and in a day when there were no fences between neighbors' houses, and there were pear trees in the backyard north of us, apricot and crabapple trees in our backyard, apple trees to our east and south, and grapes, oh, beautiful grapes, growing over a carport across the street to the west. So I can relate to Micah's heart and picture. Can you? Oh, friends, ripe fruit is the best, isn't it? It has a particular beauty, an unmatched color when the sun has tinted it to fulfillment. Faithful believers have that. The beauty, the glow of holiness, a mark of maturity in Christ. Ripe fruit also has a tenderness. A ripe peach doesn't crunch when you sink your teeth into it. Now, faithful believers have that too. It's a tenderness of spirit, a sensitivity towards sin, a tenderness toward the Lord so that our hearts rejoice at the sound of his name, a tenderness toward the Holy Spirit so that we recognize and follow his promptings. Look at a pecan tree. And we can see that ripening fruit also has weight. Branches which once stood upright are bowed down. That remind you of anything? Oh, it reminds me of humility. Faithful believers are also humble. Ripe fruit is sweet, not sour. You know, most fruit in the stores today is picked green. And when they do that, something's going to be missing. The burst of flavor from a ripe great grape. The juice running off your chin when you bite into a ripe peach. Flowing sweetness. Oh, maturing believers have that. A sweetness of spirit growing in grace and sympathy, love, kindness to others, and compassion for all. Ripe fruit also has a loose hold on the things of the earth. You shake a tree limb with fruit on it, and ripe fruit will fall. Faith, full believers, maturing believers, set their joy on things above. Their longings are for a better land and the things of this earth grow dim. Well, what causes the ripening? Well, that's the sap flowing through the limbs, the light of the sun, the gentle shower of rain, the dew. And that's the Christian life abiding in Christ, walking in his light, experiencing the showers of his grace. Micah, a countryman from a fertile land. He probably knew these things far better than we know them. And his soul desired them. Friends, those are powerful words. The words of a man who heard and proclaimed the Lord's case against Israel. 
who knew God's love, his work of grace. But more than that, he saw the Lord as the gardener and understood that the gardener's reward is the ripe fruit. Christian brothers and sisters, should the love that the Lord showered upon us from the cross be rewarded with sour grapes and griping apples? May our souls desire the ripe fruit like Micah. Micah 7, verses 7 through 9. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and he executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. And fellow believers, Jesus did all of that for us. Verse 18 who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Verses 19 through 20. You will again have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abram. You have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Oh, hear that and be reminded once again, God keeps his promises. Well, that's Micah. And I invite you, Lord willing, to join me next quarter as we study the Gospel of John, chapters 1 through 11.